All right, Alexander, let's uh, talk about what's going on in the UK with the economy, and let's talk about what's going on in Germany with the economy. So um, you're right back in the UK. How are things looking? They're looking grim. Now, I'm going to say uh, straightforwardly that returning to Britain, to London from abroad, has never been the most happy experience, as any traveller can confirm. But when I did return to London from um, Athens on Sunday, it was even worse than usual. Uh, in fact, it was much worse than usual. And there's major disruptions at the airports in London, um, uh, all of them, apparently. And the reason for that is straightforward, that airport workers are simply not turning up to work anymore. They're very underpaid. They're being hammered by the cost of living crisis. And they're just not motivated to work. And um, on our flight in, the pilot of our aircraft was constantly giving us updates about how troubled the situation was and how we would have problems when we got there and how the plane, when it left, had problems when it was you know, flying to Athens to pick us up. And it was massively delayed in consequence and it was massively delayed getting to London, it was basically because there just weren't people at the airport to service it, uh, at the London airports to service it. And of course, when we did eventually arrive in London, it turned out that there weren't any baggage handlers and it took for ages for us to get our luggage. And that's just one example, one small example. And the reason airline workers aren't turning up is because, of course, they're underpaid, but they're being hit by the um, cost of living crisis. And everybody is now being hit by the cost of living's crisis. And it's, there's a general sense, a general mood in Britain that things are not looking well. Just returning to my trip into London, um, along, you know, our, our, you know, we took the taxi to drive in to, to our home from the airport, from the railway station to our airport. And, of course, we found beggars literally going around, you know, on the road near Barber Arch with, you know, cups, stopping cars to try and get people to give them donations. <laughs> Not something you normally expect to see in London. So this is the bad sense that the country is in. And we're getting now very bizarre proposals from the politicians. So the Labour leader... Keir Starmer, who, remember, um, you know, won the Labour leadership election. He was going to be the moderate. He was going to be the person who was going to pursue business-friendly policies, unlike Jeremy Corbyn's socialistic ones. He's now come up with a proposal for an across-the-board blanket freeze on energy prices. In other words, the government is to integrate, intervene directly into the energy market, cap energy costs, cap household bills, freeze them. It doesn't not clear to me how this is supposed to work, whether the government is supposed to subsidise the energy companies, which are going to be under enormous pressure if this happens, or whether, on the contrary, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, across-the-board nationalisation of the energy industry in Britain, I just, I, I, I mean, this isn't at all clear to me how it's supposed to work. Um, of course, it's not going to work. It's just a slogan. But it, the very fact that we're getting all these extreme, radical proposals being put forward tells you how bad the situation in Britain ha has become. And, of course, this proposal to freeze energy prices is a sort of eye-catching proposal that politicians come up with when things are looking very, very bad, when they sense that people are in deep crisis, but they have no real, real realistic solutions about what to do. So they come up with these suggestions, which nobody, I think, is going to take seriously, but they're eye-catching, and they give the idea that, you know, there are idea things that could be done, but nobody really thinks that they can be done and nobody expects them to succeed. And that's Britain. But in Germany, it's equally bad. The German regulator now says 
that Germany must cut energy output, energy uh, uh, use by 20% to get through the winter. You remember a short while ago it was 15%. How does a modern economy reduce energy consumption by 20%? I mean, it's, it, it can only be achieved by switching factories off. I mean, it's the only way you can do it. And that would mean laying off workers. You're going to keep those workers paid. How are those companies going to pay those workers um, indefinitely if, they're not in, if they, those workers are not doing anything? Um, that's inevitably going to deepen inflation problems. And we're hearing now more and more reports that that's feeding into problems in the banking system and could, could potentially cause greater problems in the banking system. And it's also increasing tensions between Germany and some of its EU partners, with the Germans now pointedly asking, what is Lagarde's plan? This is, you know, the ECB's plan. What is this transmission mechanism whereby Lagarde says that she's going to continue to support Italy and the other southern European states now that quantitative easing is ending. So I've mixed some, if you like, um, anecdotal information with some of the visible signs of decay, the, you know, the more open signs of decay in Britain. Britain, in my opinion, is in a very, very dark place. Um, but the situation in Europe looks to be just as bad. OK, um, for the UK, why doesn't. Uh, why doesn't the UK, why doesn't uh, I, I, the Boris Johnson government, the soon to be Liz Truss government, since she's uh, well ahead in the polls, why don't they just roll back sanctions on <laughs> Russia well, and save their people from this misery? Well, that's that's the actual practical thing they could do. I mean, it's not the question of freezing energy prices. That's going to make the situation worse. Cutting energy consumption by 20% is only going to make the situation worse. It's not, those are not real solutions. As I said, they are, those are, are, are rhetorical poses. I mean, you can, you, Germany's not going to be able to cut consumption, energy consumption by 20%. It's, I, I've never heard of such a thing being done in a modern economy. I mean, it would mean people going, uh, it would probably mean closing down the country for days on end. So it's, it's just not practical. What you're suggesting, rolling back sanctions, is practical. But doing that would mean raising the white flag. It would mean accepting that this whole policy, this economic war of attrition that has been waged since February has been lost, and of course European politicians can't bring themselves to do that. One of the most surreal things about Keir Starmer's energy, uh, you know, price cap, price freeze idea in Britain is that if you read the British media, you will see no attempt to connect the energy price crisis and the fact that there's this explosion in energy costs with the Ukraine war or with the sanctions. There's this avoidance of the ob obvious. It's, there's this British expression, you know, not looking at the elephant in the room. They don't want to see the elephant in the room. They don't want to do this in Germany. They don't want to do this in Britain. And in the meantime, they're coming up with these fantastic suggestions uh, which don't address the underlying problem. And... As a result, things just go on getting worse. And I don't know what the end point in all of this is going to be. I, um, logically, you would expect something to break sooner or later, political leaders to change their stance. But at the moment, they're digging in and they're coming up with all these magical ideas, cut energy consumption by 20 percent, freeze prices, do things like these these things, in other words, massively intervene in the working of the economy in a way that can only make things worse.
Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of true what you said, but I, I will put an amendment in there, uh, Alexander. Um, the mainstream media, when they do explain the, uh, the energy crisis and the economic crisis, they do say a crisis because of Putin's invasion yeah. of Ukraine yeah. or because of Putin's yeah. war in Ukraine. They never say that it's not really Putin's war in Ukraine that is causing this trouble, but it's the sanctions yeah. that uh, the EU, Europe, the UK, that they've placed on Russia that are causing these sanctions. So they never, they just leave it to Putin's invasion of Ukraine and they just leave it there. They don't explain yes. that uh, the actual invasion of Ukraine hasn't caused this uh, this energy crisis no. whatsoever. It was the response from the collective West. But um, there are reports that Germany, I mean, I'm looking at Bloomberg right now and actually most of Europe. And this came out in uh, this article on the 3rd of, of August, 2022. And it says that European gas prices ease with inventories and demand and focus. The region's fuel stockpiles are at about 70% full near average. And then the article goes on to say that uh, while Russian gas is, is remained very low, at least it's steady. And they're bringing in a whole bunch of uh, LNG from uh, the U.S. And uh, the, the general... Uh, assumption from this article from Bloomberg is that uh, this winter, Europe, UK, and the EU will make it through because they've kind of patchworked together a way to get through. Is Do you agree with that? Well, if that is correct, then why is the German regulator demanding a 20% cut in energy consumption? I mean, you know, you can't really have them both ways. I mean, that's the German regulator. That's, that's what Bloomberg not, is saying. That's, you know, so Bloomberg is saying one thing. The regulator is saying something completely different. Now, I, I, I suspect what Bloomberg is assuming is that Russian gas is going to continue to be supplied. <laughs> I mean, now, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. But l let's assume that, you know, they do manage to stagger through the winter. Okay. And then what? I mean, I I even Olaf Scholz made a speech just the other day in which he said that, you know, even when we when we uh, finally solve these energy problems, and that's going to take a long time, then, of course, we are still going to be paying a lot more for our energy than we did previously. So one way or the other, you know, it's either, you know, death immediately or death by a thousand cuts, because, of course, if Germany is going to be spending an awful lot more on its um energy that it has been then why that how does it maintain its competitiveness but as i said i come back to what i'm saying if energy prices are going to soar in britain in uh, the autumn and keir starmer is asking for a freeze a price freeze and if the german regulator is calling for a 20 percent reduction in gas use in, in energy use it doesn't suggest that they think that the situation is under control, even for the winter. Uh, Olaf Scholz is going to be going to, uh, to Canada. He's going to meet with Trudeau and they have a plan to uh, use hydrogen fuel to replace mm -hmm. natural gas. Yeah, that's going to be the plan that they're putting together. Uh, Canada is going to provide the hydrogen, which most hydrogen needs natural gas, by the way, to to, uh, <laughs> to to provide energy. So uh, e either way, th this is what they're cobbling together. Um, August 21st to 23rd, they're going to be meeting. So hydrogen is, is looking like that's going to be the solution. Uh, Habeck is going to be going with uh, Schultz. And uh, this comes after Germany was not successful in getting any type of uh, replacement via Qatar yeah. to replace Russian fuel. Yeah. by Qatar. Qatar slammed the door on them. This was announced last week. There's nothing yeah. for Germany there. But uh, they're looking at Canada now in yeah. order to replace not the natural gas, but to completely reconfigure the uh, the energy uh, system of Germany towards hydrogen now. Is, yeah. is it the, might uh, work. It might even work. The golden thing, the golden yeah. energy, yeah. energy cure. Yeah. What, what, what do you make of, of yeah. this? It, 
I mean, it might work. It might it might be absolutely successful in ten years, twenty years. I mean, you know, can't do it tomorrow. I mean, it, it can't be done like that. I mean, a, anybody who has any knowledge of industrial processes, which I do, by the way, I, I mean, this is something I did used to do, knows that these things take time. I mean, set creating the infrastructure, organizing the commercial mechanisms to do this. Uh, uh, working out the science. I mean, remember, this isn't even a technology that that exists at the moment. I mean, you know, that there's some scientists who think it may work, but I mean, we haven't we haven't reached that point. But you know, we have to first do the science, then we have to uh, 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 convert the science into a workable technology and product. Then we have to create the infrastructure. Then we have to, you know, redesign the industrial base and the energy base to actually work with this new fuel. As I said, you know, 10 years, 20, it might work, but it's not going to solve the problems in a few months. And if we talk about Qatar, you remember how back in early March, Habeck went to Qatar and he came away from Qatar and he said he'd had a meeting with the Emir of Qatar and Qatar had given him categorical promises that they were going to provide Germany with all the LNG that it needed. And he got a long term deal from Qatar for all of that. And I said that he was talking absolute nonsense. And Qatar had promised no such thing. But of course, the Financial Times, as I remember, continued to run with Harbeck's story. It's the same with the hydrogen gas. I mean, you know, you, you, these are not realistic proposals. Like, it's, it's as fantastical as Keir Starmer's en, uh, energy freeze idea. I mean, an energy freeze idea to do you know, until what? You, know, you, you have to have more practical solutions now. I think that German industry, when they hear this thing, uh, especially the car industry, the steel industry and the energy the, the you know the mechanical engineering industries the chemical industry they must be shaking their heads with horror so um they could roll back the sanctions my belief yeah. on all of this is they could roll back the sanctions do it quietly and my hunch is that a majority of the people in uh in the uk and in germany uh won't notice or won't won't really care that much no. That would just be my hunch. No. There'll be there'll be some people, maybe even political opposition, that will say you guys raised a right well, a white flag, you lost, Putin beat you, and all these things. But I think for the most part, uh, after a week or so, people will forget all about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, that's just my own hunch. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, that could be one thing that they can do. But they won't do it. And the reason they won't do it is because perhaps their goal is to uh, use Putin's quote, invasion of Ukraine as the reason to move towards renewables. Yeah. But they don't want to shock and awe people into into renewables. They want to kind of slow boil the frog. So they want people to suffer. They want people not driving their cars, not flying on airplanes, um, not heating their homes as much. But they don't want them to completely suffer. They want them to get poor but they don't want complete poverty. They want them to suffer, but they don't want them to suffer too much because if they suffer too much or get too poor or freeze too much, or if they lose too many jobs or too many businesses close down, well, then then you could have people out on the streets. There's been a lot of articles, especially coming out of Germany, where many people are worried of uh, of revolt, yeah. of people getting out on the streets and revolting, yeah. which shows that the politicians are thinking about this and they're trying to say, okay, how can we get to this renewable utopia, especially Hoppick and Brabach, I'm yeah. sure, are thinking like this. How yeah. can we get to the renewable Green Party utopia, but not get to a point, not drive the people to the point where they're coming after our heads? You know, so how do we, how, how do we balance this out? Yes, we can use Russia. They're the perfect villain. Putin's the perfect villain. He's doing all of this to us. So we have to go to Canada and get hydrogen and do all of these things. But at the end of the day, that seems to be what they're trying to do. Yeah, I completely get agree. people off of this stuff. You know, make them suffer, but just not too much. Not too much. 
I, I completely agree. I think that's exactly the agenda, at least of some people like Habeck and Baerbock and some of the people in the both political parties in Britain, by the way, who are, uh, you know, very committed to this um, alternative energy utopia, as you put it, including Boris Johnson, by the way, who set, in my opinion, utterly fantastical uh, net zero targets, uh, uh, um, um, well, zero targets for carbon emissions. I mean, you know, uh, by 2030 or whatever it was. But I, I think you're absolutely right on, on rowing back sanctions and nobody noticing. That's exactly what they've done with the food sanctions. They, they, they didn't admit to that fact, but the European Commission has quietly rode back on the food sanctions. They quietly rode back on the insurance sanctions on transporting Russian oil. They could do all those things. And um, as you correctly said, they could go on pretending that they're waging the sanctions war, even though the sanctions themselves might have as many holes as a Swiss cheese. But at least you can maintain the appearance and you can square the, the information circle. But I think you're perfectly correct. I, I, I've been wondering about this for a very long time. It's important to say that in Germany, which is perhaps the key place for the Green Movement, in the last parliamentary elections, which happened, you know, September, last September, I mean, not so long ago, the Greens only got 15 percent. In other words, 85 percent of Germans, whatever their views, were not signed up to the whole green energy package. So how does Habeck, who I assume really believes in this or wants to see it happen, whether he believes it or not, but he wants to see this thing happen. How does Habeck, who is the vice chancellor, and the economics minister, how does he achieve it? Well, he achieves it by telling everybody that, you know, this crisis isn't his fault, it's uh, uh, Putin's fault. And at the same time, in this way, he can advance his agenda towards, um, you know, alternative energy. And you listen to Ursula at the European Commission, and those, she's from a different party, she's from the CDU, she says essentially the same thing. I mean, she says, you know, that the ultimate solution to Europe's energy problems is alternative energy. Now, hydrogen, as I said, we've talked about hydrogen, that's a 10, 20 year project, if it even works. Nuclear power, well, there's been some talk, twittering about bringing back nuclear power, but I understand that Germany's pressing on with closing down its nuclear power stations, despite suggestions that it might rethink that idea. So, essentially, we're back to renewables, to, win, to which in Germany means windmills. More windmills. Yeah, well, you know, renewables are what... Uh, renewables are for politicians today what, say, big oil was for politicians, say, in the beginning of the of the 20th century. So they all want in because that's where the, that's where they think the big money's going to be for, for them, for their families, for their campaigns, for Absolutely. all of these things, for their parties. Absolutely. That's all it is. So they're trying Absolutely. to all, you know, just push this renewables thing. I completely agree. Of course, the, 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 the difference was, I mean, you know, people like Rockefeller and co were pretty tough and rough characters, but I mean, the oil they provided did, make possible industrial, you know, a, a further process of industrialization. They made the motor car in its modern form possible. I mean, what windmills will do, well, I suppose it remains to be seen. <laughs> well, they don't care about the no, building stuff. No, they don't care, they don't care about you know, it. No, I'm not, economy now. I, I'm not, it's all I'm, about gigs. You know, you open up your app and you, and, and you sit at home and, and you order whatever it is and you yeah. don't really build anything or make anything. Oh, I agree. I'm, you I'm know, not. It's, I'm, it's renewables I'm, with big tech together. That's 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 what yeah. they're. That's where all the politicians want to want want to get in on. I, I, I'm not disputing that at all. All I am saying is that the end outcome will be different. I mean, the end outcome of oil, the, the dominance of oil, and as I said, you know, let's not sentimentalise it. It was a pretty ruthless industry, and the corruption was, um, you know, uh, you know, on, on a on a colossal scale. But it did create an industrialized world. What this will achieve 
is another matter again. But of course, in the meantime, some people will do very well out of it. And of course, uh, the politicians, as you rightly say, uh, they've already sniffed the wind and they're saying to themselves, well, that's where the advantages for us are. Yeah. Did you ever see that Daniel Day uh, Lewis movie, yeah. uh, There Will Be Blood? Yeah. With uh, Big Oil and how it contrasts the turn of, of moving, like the US, how it moved from a society that was uh, anchored in, in, in farming, in, in religion, and small communities, and it shifted to, to Big Oil. Absolutely. I, I, I've seen new, it. But I've also studied the whole subject. The new god of, yeah. uh, of America. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I, I've studied the whole subject. I mean, I, you know, to a great extent, uh, when I did American history, I was an economics historian. That was the part of America that really interested me. And, you know, I, I, I'm not sentimentalizing this in any way at all. Uh, a, a huge amount was lost. No, it was you rough. Know, only the it good was rough. Things. It was rough. a rough transition. It was awful. It was rough, yeah. uh, you know, if you know what kind of people Rockefeller and the other oil barons of that time were, you know, you know with the sort of people we're talking about. But all I am saying is that it did result in a, a, a gigantic program of industrialization. What, as I said, the renewables are going to do for us <laughs> remains to be seen. No, it'll be rough, but it's going to result in in, in collapse and sedation. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I don't think they want activity this time around. No, I agree with that. Is, no, I, is, I, is I, 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 which is the United States in its heyday, which was, you know, the greatest industrial machine ever created and, you know, a very vital society. And this one, well, it's going to probably put everybody asleep. Which is the plan. Anyway, all right. Maybe we went a little bit off, off course there, but <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there. The Durad.locals.com, everybody, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.